knowledge will forever govern ignorance. And a people who mean to be their own ruler must arm themselves with the power knowledge gives. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julio Romney. In collaboration with the University of St. Martin, I am pleased to be part of this thing and basically provide knowledge or information on the constitutional structure of St. Martin. I think knowledge that's essential for our better understanding of our constitutional structure, and particularly in the in the, basically in, in the time in, that we are facing today where we have issues with our government, government instability, the need for measures to combat anti-poverty and other social issues. And it is important that we get the spaces of knowledge so then we too can participate in the system. Okay, the effective, the most knowledgeable person could be the best citizen. And, and the knowledge that I, the, what I'm going to share with you tonight is based on what I have studied, knowledge that I too have gained and I want to pass on to my fellow St. Martins, to my fellow citizens. For those who don't know me, I am from St. Martin. I grew up right here in Phillipsburg when where we stand was nothing but pawn. I, as a youngster, I played here many days, including some nights. And so basically from that, the knowledge I'm gonna share is stuff that I've gained over the years, my academic um, career, which spans a bachelor's degree in economics and political science, a postgraduate, or rather graduate degree in in um, public administration, public policy formulation and evaluation, and postgraduate in, in gov comparative government and politics. And I guess that's a long word, person, what is comparative government and politics? Comparative government and politics is basically a study detailing the different systems of government and showing the comparison one versus the other. I've also done a number of other things that have given me a great knowledge of our governing system. I've been part of a restructuring committee some years ago when St. Martin, as part of Netherlands and Antilles, was attempting to restructure themselves within, within the Netherlands Antilles or within the kingdom. And beyond that, I've also come, written numerous different papers on St. Martin, um, its budgeting technique, and most recently, I've written a position paper, a white paper, on a economic plan, a comprehensive economic plan for the development of St. Martin post um, the hurricane, hurricane Irma. So, like I said, that's just a brief synopsis of the things that I've done in the past. And I must say that undoubtedly, when one wants to change things, when you want to participate in a system, your first thing was to do to understand that system. I think that's where we're lacking quite a bit in St. Martin. We do not get involved. We feel that if we, there's no need, if we get involved, it's not going to make a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, I must say, it's going to make a big difference. And then tonight I want to talk about civic participation. It's essential that as a people, that we get involved in our community. We just can't leave it up to the politicians. So the aim, my objective here now, is to give you a sense as to how you can participate in the process, how you two can get involved. And of course, that starts with knowing what it is, being able to, to understand, so therefore you can effectively participate. In essence, our governmental structure, or the whole structure, is based on a constitutional monarch, okay? And that we understand what is a constitutional monarch. The opposite or comparison to an absolute monarch. 
constitutional monarch then tells you that the king is the leader, he's the head of state. However, in a sense, that's ceremonial. Okay, in our system, in the constitutional monarch, and not only system, this is worldwide, this is understanding only any constitutional monarch, monarchy, that the king is more like a figurehead. He doesn't rule an absolute monarch. Now, the king, he or she rules, or in a sense, a queen. So the king is just there, and the main person that really governs St. Martin or the, the, the kingdom is the Kingdom Council of Ministers. Okay, so important that we understand that stuff. The diagram here basically gives you a sense as to how it's set up. Basically, it's a two-tier system. We have the monarch on the top, the king. The main person there, or the person that work it, is would be the Kingdom Council of Ministers. The Kingdom Council of Ministers is essentially the, the Council of Ministers of the Netherlands. And when there are issues or when there are concerns about St. Martin, then the Minister of Plenipotentiary comes into play, and he sits or she sits there. And we must clearly understand now that the, the, king, the, the um, Minister of Plenipotentiary has no really vote, has no vote as a matter of fact. That person is just advises. If there's an issue related to St. Martin, they will go right into the Council of Ministers, the Kingdom Council of Ministers, and advise. So you must keep that in mind. They just advise. So in effect, St. Martin, or not only St. Martin, but the other islands within the, the, the kingdom, they too don't have any power to influence stuff at the kingdom level. They can go and advise, but actual vote, they don't. Okay? So that in itself set us what a little deficit in democracy, as they would call it. In essence, you know, we are all, they, they make the decisions there. And it further goes on now that the governor is a representative of the kingdom. So the governor, he is here in St. Martin, he sits and he basically represents the kingdom. And his position now, remember now, the king would be the head of state. So he then represents the head of state. And coming further then, then comes the second tier, which is the constituent state of St. Martin. And you'll hear me often referred to as a constituent state. We find persons say, country St. Martin. Look at it, but in this context, we are the furthest from a country. Okay. And most persons here, they will admit that we don't have the power that a country has, yet we want to refer to it as a country. And I think it's important that in order for us to go one step forward, we must know where we are. We must understand and accept what we are. Nothing wrong with being a constituent state. It's then something to strive if you want to become a country. When one's talk about a country, it clearly implies that you are independent. That your statutory document is superior to any other statutory document. However, it's clearly that our constitution is subordinate to the kingdom, or rather the, the charter. And this gives you a sense that in general, in the presidential system okay, of government, that the head of state is, okay, okay let's, let's step backward, is that in our system, once we come down to the second tier, what we have, we have a parliamentary system of government as opposed to a presidential system of government. And I think it's important that we understand what is a parliamentary system versus a presidential system. We are part of a parliamentary system of government. And it's clear that there are some questions that or rather persons come up and saying things that this is so and that so, and we'll get into those specific things later. That basically taking the, taking the parliamentary system out of context. 
And again, I said it's important that we know exactly what is the parliamentary system so we know what to expect. Okay, and if you follow here, it says, in, a, in general, in a presidential system of government, the head of government is popularly elected. Okay, by contrast, the head of government in a parliamentary system is selected by the legislature. The majority party or coalition of the party that forms the majority in the legislature. In other words, the process of selecting selection is done by the majority party or the coalition of parties. See? So that's a clear difference. In the presidential system, the executive body, the president, is elected. We follow a parliamentary system, it's the, the executive body is appointed. See, that said, the central point is that the head of government, to include ministers and parliamentary system, are chosen by the governing majority party or coalition party. And that's one of the things, I guess, that's, if you want to call it a flaw, within a parliamentary system, that we end up with a coalition as opposed to one person or one party ruling. Okay? And it's in essential, nothing is really wrong with that. Nothing, I mean, one can get around it. If one understands, when you move to governing, you have to govern, and governing involves consensus building. And if you're really about governing, you'll put all the party politics aside and govern. And that is essential. We don't, we don't get a clear understanding of that. Okay? And our system, for reasons, we tend to be continuously in a campaign mode. And if we're in that mode, then governing becomes even more difficult. Another part of it that you'll often hear persons saying in our system, and you hear the politicians saying that, and you hear other persons saying, they downplay the significance of what? The political party. In a parliamentary system, the political party is essential. The political party determines, basically keep the system together, as opposed to a presidential system. Presidential system, you or the president is elected independent of the legislative branch. So he elects himself. In a parliamentary system, you don't do that. You are, the, the executive body is appointed by the, the parliament. Or in essence, the coalition parties that comes together, they determine who the prime minister will be. Usually, normally, it would be the leader of the party that has the most votes. But that is not necessarily, it does not have to be that way. Okay? They can choose anyone. But in most cases, they would then choose the leader of them. Again, in our system, we use a proportional representation. What proportional representation means, basically that they would be elected in proportion to uh, the parliament, representative representation in parliament would be in proportion to the number of votes that that party get. Okay? And this is one of the points that clearly debunks the whole notion when one talks about that, um, you often hear that, that the member of parliament, once he or she gets elected, then it's the seat, quote unquote, belongs to that person. They discount the party. And I want to say to those folks, tonight, if you look clearly, and we go to, to Article 47, Okay, we're going to build a case, Article 47 of the Constitution. It clearly says, members of parliament shall be elected by proportional representation within the limits to be laid down by national ordinance. So, in essence, one would say, and you often hear the person say, well, the seat belongs to that person or the member of, of um, parliament. And one, I've heard it more and more by different um, politicians that that is alluded to in the Constitution. The Constitution provides for them to, to 
to you know, take the seat with them if they choose to, to leave the party. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the furthest thing from the truth. And if we go to, and I said, if we look at it, you said members, you know, again, Article 47, members of, of parliament shall be elected by proportional representation within the limits laid down by national ordinance. Then let us take a step further. One doesn't understand it, please go to the explanatory notes of the Constitution. And that gives us a detailed understanding and debunks the whole idea, the whole concept of one thinking that the seat belongs to that person. And we'll read from that. It says, the proportion representation system is distinguished by the fact that the number of seats won is determined on the basis of the division of the total number of votes cast in the entire country by the number of available seats in parliament. So in a sense, the number of seats available, and then we get the total number of votes, and we di divide that, that gives us a quota. And then that quota determines the number of seats that any political party gets. Okay, so it's a quota, and at that point, what, what happens? The seats are allotted to the party. Let me go further, it says, in other words, the party that wins 10% of the votes in election would also hold 10% of seats. Proportional representation, okay, proportional representation system does, does the greatest justice to election. Okay. So the, that in, in essence, that is the best way to get the number of, of, based on the number of votes, a person having that, or that number of persons having representation in parliament. And you could go for the, an assistant that we use, we have a sort of a, uh, I would want to say antiquated system of calculating that. And if one would recall, in case you don't know, I have proposed a, a um, piece of legislation and and that's the decision we suggest or suggested that we turn to the de Hunt method. And I wouldn't get into that, but it's a long thing. But what the Hunt method do, it gives us a much more clear, a much better representation of the population in, in Parliament. It's within the, the, the um, explanatory notes, it clearly says that the distribution of seats and membership of parliament is based on the system list. Okay, here again, is based on the systems list, not a system of person. Clearly again, again, is based, the, so therefore, when we talk about an MP saying that the seat belongs to him or her, that is totally incorrect. It clearly states within the, um, the, the explanatory note that is based on the systems list. System list meaning the party not the individual. It clearly says, uh, based on the system, not the person. Candidates are nominated via the lists that are drawn up by the political parties taking part in the, in the election. Without a question, it clearly states, one go back to explanatory notes, and you can see that. So when the person thing talk to you that they say, well, the seat belongs to him or her, we get clear, that is not true. It's the furthest thing from the truth. And it's important that we as the electorate, we as voters know this, okay? That, so therefore, if we, could, we could hold these politicians accountable. We could let them know, wait a minute, what you're saying is totally incorrect. What I want to go back again, because we find a lot of things that a person says is totally incorrect. And I think that we must understand these things because then we can best represent, defend, and then hold politicians accountable. One of the things we hear, a big talking point that you'll hear often coming from persons, is that, for instance, they've talked about the Sarah Westcott Williams cabinet, the William Marlin cabinet, Leona Marlin cabinet too. It's, I mean, nowhere in the Constitution talks about a cabinet. In essence, what is a cabinet? A 
cabinet, when you have a cabinet, it means you appoint them. Granted, within the parliamentary system, there are certain cases and certain instances where that is the case, where the prime minister elects, where once he's elected, he or she can, can appoint the cabinet. In our system, that is not the case. The prime minister, he, he or she is basically what? The prime minister, the first minister. They are all equal. There's nothing as such about his or her cabinet. The prime minister's cabinet is that body that sticks around and, and advise him or her. The council ministers do not advise the, the, the prime minister. Or the prime minister doesn't look for leadership from, from, from the um, rest of the ministers. Okay, someone has to lead, so therefore the prime minister is the person that leads. Okay. Chances are they have gathered this and taken it from the Dutch, or from, from the Netherlands. Okay. And when the Netherlands speak about the prime minister's cabinet, what they're referring to is the prime minister, or the council of ministers rather, they usually get together with the SGs, and together they form the cabinet. And that cabinet then advises the prime minister or the council of ministers. And then the council of ministers goes back into their little thing and do their little whatever they do. And the final decision is made by the council of ministers, not the cabinet. One can see no way in the constitution we talk about a cabinet. So, and I think it's important, and we must understand it, that we just can't go ahead and just bring terms together and say, okay, this is what we're gonna, no. It must be as such that if, if I am in Timbuktu and one speaks about a cabinet in St. Martin, that I know exactly, I don't have to be there, okay? We cannot create another language and say, okay, good, this is particular to St. Martin. The whole concept of a parliamentary system is not particular to St. Martin. And when one says you have a parliamentary system, then it must be understanding what is a parliamentary system, and it must be within the norms of a parliamentary system. So I think it's important that we should say to our folks, no, let us use the correct terminology. Let us not mislead our people. Okay? If you don't know, ask somebody. Learn the whole concept. If you don't know, learn. If you know, teach. Right? And that's what I think, and I try my best, that we are a people. We could understand. And what we can do, we must learn. Another thing we hear talking about, talk about my minister. See? Here again, you heard us say, okay, my minister, come, persons come in, so into play, and, and they said, well, you know, I want this ministership, I want that. And again, one must understand the whole system of parliamentary system. It's not about my minister, it's not your minister. It's the minister as part of the executive branch of government. In a parliamentary system, what you do is divided. We have the executive branch and the legislative branch. The, the executive branch comes directly out of the legislative branch. We often heard persons talking, and I, anyway, the separation of powers. They call it three trias political, whatever that is, I, I don't know, I can't. In fact, Hunavel can tell exactly what it is. Tell me what it is, Ruth. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's the trias political lead. That was um, designed by um, Montesquieu, a French one. And I would say to folks, the three years political, within a parliamentary system, it's an empty concept. You cannot find that separation of powers within a parliamentary system. It is implied. Okay? And if we understand a parliamentary system, then we're not looking for that. 
within a presidential system, as, uh, you know, in contrast, yes, separation of powers. Because what? The president is elected independent of the legislative branch. He selects or she selects the cabinet, and that person works for him, so to speak. In a, in a parliamentary system, that is not the case. It's implied because the executive branch, which is the, part of the, the council of ministers, comes directly out of what? Parliament. And they're supposed to work in conjunction with, the, with Parliament. Okay. Parliament, which is a coalition of government, of, of, of persons, of, of parties that forms Parliament, when it comes to governing, they will put together what a governing program. And it's incumbent upon the ministers to carry out that governing program. Ministers are executors, they're going to execute. Their job is to manage, not politics. Their job is to manage. And it's essential. And I say, when you go in a person you want to do to vote tomorrow, make sure that we ask those candidates, okay, when you're talking about appointing a minister, what are the duties of the minister? And it's important that we get a minister who's familiar with the subject matter in which he or she manages. If that's not the case, then what are we going to get? Nothing. You see, often you hear the person saying, well, this person, Johnny, he, he didn't run on, on, a, on a list, so therefore he should not be a minister. One again understand the system of governing. A person that holds that position will be best off knowing the subject manager, matter. You cannot send call it a, I don't know, a carpenter and expect him to do a great job on economic development. Same, you would not take, you know, even myself. Okay, I'm a scholar of comparative government and politics. You wouldn't say, okay, who is a hair smart guy, he got a couple of things, and I'm gonna put him to run my accounting department. What do I necessarily know about accounting? I might be a good guy, but in fact, it's not about being a good guy. It's about being, about being effective, having the tools necessary to function in that capacity. Okay, so we must not look and say, well, this guy hasn't been, in, in, been on a list, so therefore we don't think he should be a minister, he didn't run, whatever. We must take to our people. We want the best possible person in that position. Okay, St. Martin cannot move a step forward if we don't have the right persons in place. If we talk about a minister of, of Tiat, and that minister of Tiat does not have the slightest idea about what economic development is all about. If he doesn't have the slightest idea to put an economic model together to see the advancement of St. Martin, okay, to bring us back to where we were. Remember, years ago, we had a double A one rating. We fall to a double A, I think it's two rating, because of what? lack of economic activity. You'll often hear the person saying today, I'm gonna to do this, I'm gonna do that. They never tell you where they're gonna get the money from or how they're gonna get the money. You see, and this is what, folks, we have to get involved. Civic participation is essential. We must hold these persons accountable. And how are we gonna do that? By each one, teach one. If I know, I teach you, you teach me and we start to ask, because like they're always talking about the system. Nothing is wrong with our system. There is nothing wrong with our system. And I challenge anyone that says something is wrong with the system. Something is wrong with the players. It's the players, folks, it's not the system. They want to change the constitution, they want to do that. Nothing is wrong with the constitution. Parliamentary system of government has been around for years. It's tried and proven, it works. But if we don't understand it, then of course it will never work.
other thing that we've seen, one talked about considerably, and we have seen it in the last couple of months, we talk about, well, we should not have elections. We have a coalition of nine. A coalition of nine? What is that? Folks, the members of nine persons in parliament does not form a government. A government is formed by a coalition, by parties, clearly stipulated in the, in the, in the not the constitution, in the electoral ordinance. The first thing they do is not determine how many parliamentarians um, to form a government. No, it depends on, the, on the, the parties, the parties having enough seats to form that government. I said, well, I hear a person come to say, holy man, we got nine persons, so let's form a You cannot pick and match and, no, 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 no. Who is to say tomorrow another nine will come up? And what happened? You got another government. Remember now, it says what? Parliament shall be elected by proportion of the electorate. Those persons, if we look, and, and it doesn't talk about proportion of the candidate, it talks proportion of the, of the party. And if we want to go by proportion of the party, or the candidates, the persons, okay? One person who probably got 50 votes, but because of the system, he was able to get elected, or rather selected. And that's another thing we gotta look at. Once you don't have the quarter, or you haven't gotten the quarter, you're not elected, you are selected. And it's clearly in our constitution, or rather in the electoral ordinance. That's what is important. Each person, I think, for every person, you must get a copy of this. My eyes look kind of raggedy because I read it 10 times a day. See, it's not the individual, it's the party. Okay, go back. The person said, we have nine, we should have. No, it's not about that. And they said, well, first person said, well, we shouldn't have Article 59 because then we go back to election. Nothing is wrong with Article 59. Article 59 needs to be there. If, like in the case there where the government party didn't have a majority in parliament. So the thing to do is what? Call new elections. Call new elections so you can get a full majority or a mandate from the people to govern. We tend to, no, we can't do that. Um, it's expensive. Democracy is expensive. I mean, you can't say, well, I'm not going to be because it's expensive. No, no, find the money. That is democracy. You are given one chance by election to form a government. If you can't, then you have to go back. And we see that clearly. Look at Israel. We're talking about we have an election once every year. In the last six months, Israel going to the polls three times. Three times. Why? Netanyahu could not form a government. He did not have that majority support. And if we follow a thing here that, I mean, that, that we got nine persons so we can now form a new government, it doesn't work that way. And if we're doing that and have done, and of course then they've had a vote of no confidence on new government, and that's another thing. We got, we did. We had, we're in a place where the government falls, so to speak, that government then becomes the caretaker. What we have done in our good wisdom is we have get another caretaker governor, government to take over from a caretaker government. What is the reason for that? Makes absolutely no sense. And then we say we don't have money. Now you gotta, you gotta screen all these persons and then in two months, come February or January, the new elections, we bring in another set. Then we say we got Leona Cabinet One, Cabinet Two. I'm yet to find a wizard Cabinet Two. Okay. And again, folks, us as people, as citizens, we have to educate ourselves so we can say, wait, Mr. Politician, no, no, you can't do that. Okay. 
we have to educate ourselves. We have to engage in, in the civic participation. They're not gonna change, so what? We have to change them. But I think you might hear a person saying in elections, and I heard it on the radio, and every time I heard it, hear it rather, I quenched. Person saying, each candidate, my platform. Ladies and gentlemen, we have what, 112 candidates and 112 platforms? Disaster. Imagine 112 platforms going into parliament. Everyone is saying, I, I am going to do this, I, I, I. Folks, they can't do nothing. You need a majority within parliament in order to pass a piece of legislation. When a person comes and tell you, tomorrow you go on the road and the person comes to you in the campaigning and they said, you know, my platform, I am going to do this. Ask them how they're going to do it. They're fooling you, they're fooling me, they're fooling whoever they can. They cannot do it. Imagine you get a party that has 23 candidates, or you know, within, within uh, any party call, you know, hope. You know, hope is no longer around, but we can use hope for example. And he has 23 candidates. And each person supposedly got their own platform. They get elected. Which, 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 which one are you gonna follow? Do you think that the leader is gonna allow one of the other persons to say, okay, we're gonna follow him? No. He can want to do that because what? We entrench in personal politics. It's all about me. Okay? And we have to get away from that. I would say if you're going to vote tomorrow, do not vote for a person because of kinship or because you know that person or you're from the same area. In order for St. Martin to go to the next step, it's imperative that we vote along an ideology we must somehow get that incorporated into our system. Because these I, I, it doesn't happen. You can't, you can't get any place with that. It's, to, it's got total chaos. And the way to go, I guess, tell a person, you know, come up with an ideology. And I guess it's gonna be, it's gonna be difficult. Because basically, for all intents purposes, within St. Martin, and not only to, the, to St. Martin, all over the Caribbean, to the most part. There's no real ideology. And when we speak about ideology, we teach, speak about a certain approach. Whether you're conservative, or a liberal, a socialist, or whatever. And just telling you that in order for you, let's say, economy, if you want to grow the economy, or you want to govern anything, there's certain principles that you will follow. A conservative would go on tight money policy. A liberal, probably more easy in spending big government, you know, more free hand, so to speak. Okay? And this is important. If we want to grow our economy, we must decide exactly, okay, how are we gonna do that? And follow a policy follow and establish guidelines. An example, some years ago, and most recently, I went to the government department of finance in Rungland, and I wanted to find out exactly what's the budgetary approach that we're using. They couldn't tell me, there's none. So in order to be effective, you have to use a system that's there, and it's, it's one might think it's, it's not confined to United States or to Canada, whoever, no. That is a system that is tried and proven. Okay? It could be a model, something that you're gonna follow that could give you effective results. And so we again, folks, that's what we have to start doing today. And it's gonna start with me and you. The whole concept of I, 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 it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. 
And we're going to continue having elections over and over again until we hold our politicians accountable. We stop voting for a person just because we vote from down street. Okay? They must bring something to the table. We have often heard a person say talking, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We want to bring up the minimum wage, we want to do that. I'm all for that. As a matter of fact, some years ago, I did a study for the then um, commissioner of it was Commissioner of Economics, whatever. It was Louis Lavez. And based on the study that I did, that we were able to increase the minimum wage in St. Martin to uh, you know, 1,600. But of course, the, pr the proposal that I, 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 I gave him in the report talked about more other things than just increasing the minimum wage. But of course, he didn't emphasize on that. He just emphasized on, on the minimum wage. But it has to be a study to say, what will be the impact? Would it cause inflation? See, these are the key things. One will tell you, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But what is the impact? When you take away from here, you have to get money from elsewhere. So what are we doing? We just can't say, okay, we want to do this, we want to do that. Good. The cardinal question becomes, what will be the impact? how we can block that hole. Guy come and said, well, we want to put a, a, a roof on everybody's house. That will be nice. Where's the money gonna come from? Is it government responsibility to put a roof on everyone's house? One said, yeah, I would like that. But it's government responsibility to make the opportunity available for everyone to put a roof on his or her house. Not to put there, but to make the opportunity. And so therefore, we must then lean to programs, lean things that will afford and help the people to do, to do their stand. Mm. And another thing I want to talk about is often persons said, we are part of the kingdom. And they said, well, yeah, this is good that, ladies and gentlemen, being part of the kingdom is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm saying it's not necessarily a bad thing. As a matter of fact, we are in a good position for the simple, and, and uh, get this clear now, I'm not saying now that we must be part of the kingdom forever and we should not consider independence. No, I'm not saying that. Person turned to them, oh, who lead on you not for independence? I said, no, 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 don't say that. I am very much for independence, but in a responsible manner. Okay, I go back to the teaching of my mother who tell me you don't jump into the sea and then take off your clothes. You must be prepared. One of the advantages of being part of the kingdom is that what? In today's, if you want to put it to the, 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 the new world order, if you want to style it in that way, is that what? Countries are coming together. They're not separating. In the 60s, independence was a thing. Not today. Not in, in, in 2020. They're all coming together. Look at Europe, the EU. Look at United States, Canada, Mexico, NAFTA. They're busy re restructuring that. And St. Martin, being part of the kingdom, we are part of the best of two worlds. We can, as, 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 as a part of the, the, the kingdom, we are what, an associate member of EU. The fact that we are in the Caribbean, right next to the United States, we can take advantage of the Caribbean-based initiative, NAFTA parity. We can move goods and services to these two great economic blocks that can benefit us. If we get a percentage of a percentage, that's all we need. We got what, 60, 80, 10,000 10, people? We can live a high on a hog, as they would put it. 
but we have to work it. As opposed to Anguilla or some of the other neighboring islands, they don't have that opportunity. Okay. Okay. We have to be, be mindful that we do not have any goods and services that we can export. No, we don't have that. We have zero expect, export, exportation. We can't say, well, we're going to sell, I don't know. We can't even say bananas because every Caribbean island has bananas. Everybody has bananas. So we say, yeah, good, eat your own bananas because I got some too. And if you want, you, you can come and get some of mine. You see, and these are the things that we have to be mindful of. And when no politicians start talking, said, when you talk away, we want to go independent, we want this, we want that, that's good and dandy. But we must do it what? Responsibly. We can't jump out there and then decide, okay, what are we going to do? Okay? And so not in, we, we not, I mean, yes, we had our issues. We might be bad off. But guess what? If we look down the chain of the Caribbean islands, we can say, we're not that bad off at all. And they are independent, mind you. They are independent. We have to learn from those as opposed to going and make that mistake. If you can avoid making a mistake, you don't make the mistake, you learn. So it's all about, if you want to focus now, it's about focusing on building your administration development on making sure you have a sound economy, a sound governmental system. Okay? Before you said, okay, let's go independence. Okay, or you say, well, let's get out of the kingdom. Of course you want you want of course everyone wants to grow up and move on. And that what we are doing, we are what? We are exercising our right of self-determination. Self-determination means that you want to go in the direction that you want to go. And we are exercising that. Because what? We were a colony. Then we became an integral part of the Netherlands Antilles, which in turn was part of the kingdom. Now we are a constituent state. So we are growing up. That is a road. And we can do that with less stress of because of being part of the kingdom. The disadvantage here is that, yeah, they govern us. We are part of a governmental structure, the constitutional monarch, that in essence give us, yeah, no power. We, we, we can, they determine how it's going to be. They determine what's going to happen to us or what policies, what the piece of legislation that we must follow because of the system is not balanced. It doesn't give us, you know, any kind of say so, so to speak. But I can say this, that what we had in a chance, an opportunity to make that right before 10, 10, 10, and we fail. And I'm working on, in fact, I started some time ago, I'm working on, a, on another publication where we're going to talk about the evolution of the kingdom, how it has evolved. Because again, we had an opportunity to make a difference. Because then, yeah, we start over. There's going to be, there were going to be changes to the charter because now we become a separate entity within. So we went to the negotiating table. We should have been at that point say, well, wait, wait, mister. We know we are a small island in the Caribbean. We are away from the mainland. We recognize that. We recognize the fact that you have millions of people we have thousands. However, the fact is we are part of the kingdom. There's verbiage in that agreement that what we are, an equal partner. 
Give us at least one vote. If we're true, we would have never been able to outvote them, but we'll have a vote. Okay? And if you can f use that vote effectively, that vote can mushroom. I say mushroom in effect, then we can go back to the Netherlands when there's something happening and hook up with an interest group, hook up with, with and there's lots of them in, 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 um, in, 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 in the Netherlands, and get them to see from our standpoint, and I could assure you it would make a difference. Because what? The politicians in the Netherlands pay attention to the electorate. And if you get enough interest groups pleading your case for you, you can get somewhere. But right now, we are there, but we completely separate. Because okay, we, we, we can't vote in there, but if we could get people in there to understand our issues, and you're gonna find them. I mean, the, 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 the interest groups in, in the Netherlands and other parts, but they're quite liberal. I mean, they're anxious and waiting to get to do something, to, to, to demonstrate. Imagine in the United States, there are folks that just go from state to state just to demonstrate. They just love to demonstrate. That's their job. You probably see a person, hundreds and thousands of people standing in front of the White House. You know where they come from. They come from anyway. So I guess, folks, we have to get involved. We have to get the main thing. We have to get involved. It's all about civic participation, civic engagement, understanding your rights and responsibilities as a citizen. Stop saying, oh, the politician can take care of it. They're not going to take, take care of themselves. Okay? You don't work for them. They work for you. We have to take back our rights, our citizens. We are talking about other folks. No, no, no. It's just not about Lord Holland or whoever. It's about us. We have to make that stand. 